Welcome everybody. This is Tuesday Morning Grind episode number 27 and today we have Robert Glazer with us who is a privacy expert, did some time at Deloitte as a privacy consultant, currently a chief privacy officer and consultant, and then uh, a long history of being a chief privacy officer and has seen a lot. So thank you a lot, uh, Robert, for being here. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Great. It should be fun. Excellent. So you've been in privacy before privacy was on the mind of everyone else, I think. Uh, so can you talk about how did you get into it? How did you decide that you're going to get into privacy, do privacy consulting? Uh, I really didn't. So I left the military after 24 years in 1998, where I was a healthcare CIO and then moved into industry where I was a healthcare CIO and then moved from a health system to an e-business unit of a pharmaceutical company that did essentially physician patient interactions. That company was shut down. It was before its time. Now everybody does that, but no one did that at that time. At that point in time, I said, I wanted to stay with Aventis Phar Pharmaceuticals and Aventis said, we have this new position that our European colleagues are saying we have to have, which is the US chief privacy officer. Do you want it? And I said, well, I know what HIPAA is, but I'm not for sure about the rest of this stuff. So in October of 2003, I became the US chief privacy officer of Aventus Pharmaceuticals, which was then subsequently purchased by Sanofi. That then was followed by a stint as the chief privacy officer at Roche USA, which then was followed by a stint as the chief privacy officer of Genentech out of South San Francisco. So each of those was in biopharmaceuticals and each of those had progressing responsibilities and they all happen to grow along at the same time that the privacy regulatory environment was growing. So each year, each month, privacy became more and more yep. of a challenge. I got involved with colleagues uh, at the International Pharmaceutical Privacy Consortium. I think I was one of the first 500 members of the IAPP, which I think now has something like 50,000. Yep. So you can see with my white hair, I tell people that I was doing privacy before privacy was cool. And uh, it's still a great time to be a privacy geek and I love my job and what I do. So you started your career in healthcare, which, which as you mentioned, like HIPAA, I think privacy's always kind of been on the mind of healthcare, it seems like, or at least before it was everyone else. Um, what's it like going from healthcare to like worrying about privacy in general? Do you, do you think? Any similarities, differences, that kind of thing? Well, there are tons of similarities and, a, and a tons of differences, right? So most people in healthcare, so in government, we had the Privacy Act of 1974, which was then, of course, followed by HIPAA in 1996, 98, with the implementation of the privacy rule and the security rule. So that was really my key focus at that period of time. But it was also about you know, 2002, 2003, where you had some pretty significant data breaches where the states and the federal government became much more involved. And of course, we already had the European private, the EU privacy directive, which kind of set a tone for Europe. So in the work I had within biopharma, I became very, very familiar with the way Europe looks at privacy versus the way the US looks at privacy. And when you begin to talk about other industries outside of just healthcare or biopharma or med device, what it really is is a sliding scale. And what I mean by that is many employers today have self-funded insurance programs, self-funded benefit programs, and therefore they're considered a payer by HIPAA, so they have HIPAA responsibilities. But at the same time, they have all of these consumer responsibilities that are pertinent or at least are regulated by other places around the globe. So the sliding scale is, is if you're a healthcare provider, you have a lot of HIPAA and a low amount of consumer. But if you move, say, into a consumer products company, you'll have a lot of consumer and a low HIPAA. But all of them seem to have something that is very similar. And particularly in the world of my time with Deloitte, which was about the summer of 2012 to 2020, and now my time with Entesis 360 and their advised practice, the reality is, is that our clients worry about everything. 
And the, re the remarkable nature of privacy is it's never stagnant. And there's always evolution and there's always stimulation in privacy. So yeah. Europe has transitioned over to their GDPR, right? We now have Brazil. Of course, we have rest of world that has many migrations. But then we also have the states, right? We have California, Washington, Virginia. And then you have legacy laws, of course, in places like New Jersey, Massachusetts, Texas, et cetera. So it just keeps moving along. And that stimulation then comes back to that sliding scale that I was talking about and the need for folks such as myself to remain familiar with all of it, regardless of what industry your core focus is. Yeah, there's, it's been an interesting shift, that, you know, I guess due to like social media um, scandals, if you will, when you're thinking about privacy and it's kind of becoming part of the public conversation. Then you have GDPR. Um, where, whereas traditionally, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I felt like privacy was largely regulatory driven or, or kind of a B2B type of conversation. But now that it's in the public domain and consciousness, you know, everybody's talking about privacy. So ha have you put much thought into like the importance of privacy for society at large? And what yeah, are so there? first you kind of look at con cultural differences, right? And a yeah. lot of the European privacy principles are based upon what happened in World War II, particularly as it relates to sensitive data, race, ethnic origin, political affiliation, trade union membership, health status, sexual orientation, criminal history, and what happened to people because of their classifications within those domains during World War II, and they weren't yeah. good things. So culturally, the Europeans take a federal approach and they take a very personal approach to the collection, processing and protection of their personal data. So in Europe, the individual owns their data and they loan it to a company for specified purposes. In the US, we tend to turn our personal data over to companies to use in accordance with law. And that has changed over time now, particularly with GDPR, with the new Virginia law, which are becoming much more European-like. And as a result of them becoming much more European-like, privacy is being embedded at the individual cultural level or at the individual level, much like Europe in many of these jurisdictions, whereas we didn't used to see that. And just as a clarification, I want to say that I am not an attorney. I, I am a privacy um, a subject matter advisor. And so I do not interpret law, but I do advise the regulatory requirement. There's my disclaimer. We and the whole, hold you to it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is, is that there are a role for many different types of specialties in where you are executing a privacy program in a business. And there are a role, those roles really depend upon what the regulatory approach is and the regulatory approach is becoming much more stringent than it ever historically has been. And I think that's then circles back to what you were saying, which is because of, of items that are in the news, government is stepping in and saying, we can't trust folks to do the right thing. And because we can't trust folks to do the right thing, we're going to legislate. And that's a very interesting concept, and it's a big difference in the U.S. compared to where it was previously. Yeah. Do you have concerns? Like, uh, if you look at privacy trends here in the U.S. and just how we're managing as a society, as a government, does anything concern you? Yes, it's the complexity of the U.S. environment. So Europe and rest of the world, so, you know, standard phrase, where Europe goes, rest of the world follows, where California goes, rest of the U.S. follows. Um, Europe has a federal overarching privacy regulation. And most other countries around the globe that have privacy rules and regulations have a federal overarching privacy regulation. And a lot of people think that privacy is a right in the US and it's not in the Bill of Rights. There's nothing in the Bill of Rights that says private, you have a right. So government at the state level or the sector level, or even at the Federal Trade Commission is through a series of legislation or regulation mandating what privacy practices are and should be. And we do not have a federal overarching privacy law or regulation in the US. And because of that, 
whether you be a European country try, company trying to operate in the U.S. or whether you be a, a U.S. company trying to operate in the U.S., they are finding that the nuances of difference between federal and state and sector are causing a complexity of doing business that they are not seeing elsewhere. There's not a common set of rules, laws, and regulations that is germane to all industries across all domains in the U.S., and that's the complexity of today yeah. and drives, frankly, jobs for people like me. You mentioned uh, the privacy. There is no privacy bill of rights, and I've heard others say, that, you know, maybe that's an interesting concept to create a privacy bill of rights or to operate off like something like the fiduciary standard when it comes to privacy. Do you think that absent regulation that there is any possibility that companies will self-regulate and kind of try to do the right thing on their own? Or do you think the profit motive is too strong? Or So let me just say, there is no right to privacy in the U.S. Constitutional Bill right. of Rights, okay? Now, there are things like the OECD principles and things of that nature that set it out, and the U.S. is a signatory to, but it, it's becoming more and more evident that more and more companies are looking at privacy as a potential differentiator. And what I'm talking about is all you have to do is look at the television commercials of one large tech company comparing itself to another large tech company. And they're talking about how they pay more attention to privacy than the other guys do, right? And so I believe what we're beginning to see are de facto standards established by entities that are trying to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. The second thing that's coming along, I think, is historically privacy usually sat in the domain of the legal department or the compliance department. And co privacy as we know it today is really a cultural norm within companies and the companies that are most successful are those companies that have driven privacy down into the day-to-day -day functions of their business. So we are beginning to see cultural change um, associated with privacy. Now, if you take a look at some of the regulatory things, it says, you know, thou shalt comply by January 1, that would imply that you were supposed to have a new culture by January 1. And that's just not the way it works. If you look at mergers and acquisitions, a lot of times it takes four to six years to develop the new hybrid culture. So what I'm saying is, is we are in the process of developing the new hybrid culture of privacy and industries together and companies by themselves are beginning to set de facto standards that others are having to step up to. Yeah, it's, so as a consultant, are, are you seeing like um, concerns about privacy or ethics at the board level, or is it more uh, like we want to be compliant with GDPR, how do we do that? What's the nature of the, the biggest concerns? So yeah, it's, at, it's at both levels. But what I will say is since the implementation of GDPR, we have seen a much higher interest of privacy at the board level and senior leadership level for three different reasons. One is fiduciary responsibility, one is shareholder value, and one is the potential for personal liability of the individuals at the highest levels of the company. Europe has said and has come out and other places, just because you don't know is not an adequate defense. And enough has now happened, and particularly when you look at boards, they'll come from a company, you know, when you have independent board members, they'll come from a company and say, you know, we have this huge GDPR program, what the heck are we doing for GDPR inside our company? And somebody else will look around and go, you know, what's GDPR? So yeah. what we're doing is first we did, we, and you know, when I was with Deloitte, I did a lot of assessment, design and build, operationalization, and audit and monitoring. And I'm doing the same thing at Entesis 360 and their advice practice with our with our clients. Sure. The, the point there being that if you circle back around to the boards, is they are oftentimes in conjunction with independent um, with internal audit or with their compliance departments looking for external validation of what they have implemented internally in order to minimize risk to the company, whether that be financial harm or reputational harm. Right. 
Yeah, we, we do something similar where we'll come in and do like an assessment and kind of privacy program build out. And kind of the trend I see is there's there's a lot of traction up front. You know, they engage to do this project. They're enthusiastic about it. You get the assessment done. You begin implementing. And then maybe it uh, loses some of the enthusiasm because other priorities take precedence. Or we find out, like, the real risk lies with engineering or the product team because we yeah. have to integrate at that level. Have you been successful or, or um, in terms of, like, when they're building products that might capture data or might do something or engineering teams developing stuff, have you seen any successful techniques to, to engage with those teams or educate them? So there, there are two sides that answer your question. The first sure. one is, is implementation of privacy by design. So where you insert privacy into each stage of the system development lifecycle, the device development lifecycle, the application development lifecycle, or even if you're using cloud where you do a cloud implementation and, and privacy where you flip on the switch. I mean, Azure or Amazon Web Services or you know Oracle, all of those guys have the right switches. It, the devil is usually in the details where yep. folks don't flip the switch, right? So that's one. So implementing that as part of the system development lifecycle, that's number one. Number two is the companies that I've seen that are most successful have senior leadership oversight and they drive it at a programmatic level across the organization. So historically, privacy, oh, that's a legal thing. Privacy, oh, that's a compliance thing. Go do your job and people would write policies and procedures, toss them over the fence and say, you know, go implement this. And with the new reputational and financial harm standards, I am personally seeing a much higher level of interaction by senior leadership and boards than ever before in the 18 years that I've been involved in privacy. And that again is reputational harm, fiduciary responsibility, shareholder value and personal liability. But the reputational harm more than the financial harm seems to be driving many of these companies, the potential for. Which regulations uh, or how does someone get caught up in uh, like as a board member or an executive having uh, personal liability? What's what's driving that? Because I think a lot of people probably aren't aware that, that, that that's a thing. Yeah, and this is where I'm going to defer to my my legal brethren, and I'm you know I'm not going to offer a, a, a legal interpretation of sure. where it comes in. What I can say is, a number of the laws have the opportunity for class action lawsuits, and the money or the investigations, the fines, they always follow the money trail, and the money trail usually ends with those that have the oversight responsibilities. So I, I don't want to cross that line because I'm gotcha. not an attorney, but let me say personal liability is a real worry of, of board leadership that I have talked to, and that's when I usually defer them to their legal departments. Yeah, you can absent the personal liability, uh, you can read public companies 10Ks and there's definitely a trend of being worried about security and privacy, you know, yeah. as far as shareholder value goes. So it's definitely at the board level. I think, I don't know what's driving it. I know GDPR certainly is driving it. There's contractual like B2B agreements driving it. And then like the, the public is just more aware. So no one wants that bad press, I guess. But, um, I also think that there's like some societal thing. Like we have to we have to tread lightly here and consider carefully, like how we want to approach privacy as a society. Because there's like a lot we can do. We can do anything. You know, the iPhone here or the, your your smartphone is can gather almost any piece of data it wants about you, from acceleration data to geolocation data, that kind of thing. Are are you saying when you're consulting with clients, like some of that privacy forward thinking, like not just what can we do? Is it compliant with the law, but should we do it ethically? Are you hearing any of that? Uh, yes, and, and you held up your phone, and I'm going to say I'm a privacy guy, so I carry two phones. Yeah. One is my work phone, and one is my personal phone, and nay, the two shall meet. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people who carry two phones nowadays, so that's one. I've seen a lot of people who use two separate computers nowadays, right? So let me say, I think people are becoming much more conscious of privacy as a whole. And many 
people in many companies are trying to do the right thing for the right reason. And that's a huge change. It used to be, you know, um, there was one time when I was a new privacy officer and I was making the rounds of leadership and I went and saw a particular leader and they said, why are you here? We've never needed you before and we don't need you now, right? And there's another time I went and had a, a discussion with a CISO, you know, as a privacy officer. And I said, look, we need to encrypt. We need to encrypt. And he, he basically said, you know, go away. Talk to me in two years. That's when it's on my roadmap that we're going to encrypt all portable devices. Those whole groups, that whole thing has changed now. And one of the areas that I've seen, and you just tell me if I'm getting off topic here, but it, there's a huge shift in M&A. Um, companies, as part of their due diligence efforts associated with mergers and acquisitions, are asking for privacy review and privacy assessments prior to an M&A valuation occurring because they want to know if they're going to inherit an unknown risk during the acquisition of another company. So these are fundamental shifts that we are seeing at the business level that, you know, three, five, seven years ago, we never saw. Yeah, we're, we're seeing the same thing. I think where we're running into, I think we're, what we're crossing, the bridge we're crossing right now, I think successfully, seems to be in years past there, like you said, there was the legal and the compliance department that would think about privacy requirements, mostly from a legalistic perspective. But if I talk to a product owner or someone who was in charge of developing a market and monetizing the data, you know, they weren't thinking about privacy. And if, if they were thinking about privacy, the question was, how can I do this with the minimum amount of regulatory requirements possible? It wasn't really ethical. And we've had, I would say there's definitely some shift recently of someone saying, you know, should we be gathering this data? Like, yeah, we could, but can we do without it? What's the implications? And then you have like the harms out, the privacy harms that uh, Solve is writing. And then, you know, some of the generally accepted privacy principles, people are starting to think more and more about that. Are you seeing an expanded vocabulary amongst your, your uh, clients? Like they're able to articulate these thoughts a little better? Not only are they able to articulate, but they're able to do an end around. And what I mean by that is I've done work over the past three or four years with a number of companies that perceived that the individuals who were responsible for privacy in their organizations were either underfunded, unorganized, or were purely at the policy level and not the execution level. So you gave the example just a minute ago of a marketing person. And I will tell you, you know, and it's true that many privacy departments are underfunded, but I will say that the number of marketing departments and the number of IT departments that say, we know we have an inherent risk and we know that there's this thing called GDPR or CCPA out there, and we know we have obligations and we want to hire you not only to do the project that we want you to do, but we want to ensure that we are fully compliant with the privacy rules and regulations, regardless of the stat, regardless of the position of the rest of our company, because I want to keep my job. So the, the, the vocabulary at the level of things like research and development, uh, marketing, sales, IT management, IT security, HR benefits has skyrocketed over the past three to five years into an area that I'd always hoped to see, but but I never thought I really would see. Yep. So I want to shift gears from the business and talk about a couple of fun topics. Uh, so you're clearly a privacy expert. Can you talk about what do you do personally to to protect your privacy, if you will, in terms of online presence, technology, that kind of thing? Are there things that you think about? Yeah, so um, number one is I, I never allow my personal and business life to meet and I hold up my two phones a while ago, right? So that's, that's a form of protection. Um, I tell people that I am a Facebook stalker and not a Facebook user, right? My use of social media is near nil and even on LinkedIn, it's, it's minimized, right? 
I will tell you, I got six or eight data breach notices last year. There's only so much you can do when everything you own is out in the public space. So, you know, I have all the credit monitoring services. I have all those lockdowns. I do those, you know, I use those routinely. Um, an interesting story in, that I had is I was down in New Zealand and I was doing a presentation. And what I worry about is it's the inadvertent disclosure of personal data. And after I did this presentation, this guy came walking up to me and he says, you know, I'm from South Africa. He says, in South Africa, you know, the little Star Wars figures on the back of minivans, you know, they have Darth Vader and Princess Leia and, you know, all the little yeah. stormtroopers. He says, the bad guys in South Africa, they look for those that do not have a man or a dog. And those are the are the people that they will target because they don't believe that a male or an animal is in the family. And so, you know, like when my son put out on Facebook, oh, we're so sad your, our German shepherd has died. I told him, I said, you just told everybody in the neighborhood we have we no longer have a German shepherd, right? Yeah. So I, I, I believe in keeping my personal business as personal as possible. And I have friends, just like when I was growing up, you know, I have white hair, so my growing up was different than your generation. But I, I minimize my public disclosure and I try to minimize my inadvertent public disclosure of personal data by segregation of personal and professional. What about uh, using like listening devices in your house? Like I won't name any brands, but you know, like smart devices in the home. Would you All advise against that? Well, let me say all over the external part of the house, you know, there is uh, one particular device uh, that we have in the house that sometimes goes off and then you really begin to wonder. But um, we, you know, we use it for its technology purpose. What I worry about are things like passive collection, right? Yeah. Pixelated smart TVs or, you know, what my viewing habits are on a streaming service, you know, and whether I watch stuff that from when I was a kid, like Bambi, you know, versus I'm watching Star Wars. Those are the things that I worry about because those are the things that you, they just don't sit conscious in your mind at all. You don't even think twice about it. Yep. So even as a privacy professional, as much as, as aware as I am, there are, you know, many people, you know, just, you know, Joe Smith walking down the street who doesn't even, you know, that's not even an awareness. So education is becoming a huge component. Yeah. I always think to myself, if you could, if you could get someone's browsing search history, their Amazon shopping list and their Netflix watch list, you could probably know almost everything about them. You could probably assume their family makeup, their gender, their race, their political affiliation. I'm sure there's some analytics that could be done and it probably is being done. I think uh, there's a YouTube video out there somewhere, and I, I want to say it was like Norway or Denmark or Sweden or somewhere, and, and people would walk up and, and they'd say, sit down, and like within 10 minutes, you know, they had their entire life history. You graduated from here, you did this, you did oh, yeah. that, you did this, just by getting their name, right? Or Carnegie Mellon has done a lot of research, and um, as it relates to, to HIPAA, and, and many other pieces of research by where you can use public information to re-identify non-public protected information. So, you know, when we do a lot of work in med device or in biopharma, you work about, you worry about anonymization and pseudo-anonymization, but one of the big trends in business is much more of a data governance trend versus a traditional privacy trend, just because the data is everywhere and you get un expected results when data is merged or combined or moved back together in a um, informal way. Yeah, I know GDPR has like the de-identification, they use a different word, but same concept, but the question is, can you really, <laughs> to your point, because you can combine data and, and re-identify someone pretty easily. Yeah, the definition of de-identification and anonymized are entirely different and a lot of people don't realize yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Be identified and anonymized are truly different. What about like mass surveillance? Because uh, recently uh, the EU with SHREMS, you know, SHREMS 2, uh, 
did away with privacy shield, if you will, uh, which was the lawful basis in which you could transfer data with the EU. And uh, I think the reason cited was because of potential government uh, subpoena of data. So, you know, EU was uncomfortable with that. So what's your take on like the, the US's role on mass surveillance and in the whole privacy ecosystem? You know, the thing that I don't understand in the mass surveillance thing is if you look at the number of ca public cameras, as an example, in the UK that are monitoring people walking down the street, yeah, that to me is a form of mass surveillance. And the permissibility of that and things like speed cameras and everything else that capture license plate, that seems to me to be government monitoring. And I don't understand why that is culturally acceptable, but other government um, surveillance as we define it is not. And I yep. think the difference is, is the nuance of the data that could be potentially identified and the nuance of the conclusions that could be potentially made. So with that said, you know, we're beginning to see states put in video, um, um, video monitoring protection you know, we're beginning to see states put in facial recognition uh, type minimization, but the casinos have been doing that stuff for years. So it's going to be very interesting to see where all this falls out, particularly as companies who have used the internet to pull publicly available information begin to market those data sets to other third party companies as a way to, to differentiate individuals at the individual level. I mean, back in the olden days, you know, we used to worry about whether or not a background investigation on hiring was more than a yes, no. Did they actually keep the data that came with the background investigation? And now just by searching the web or asking for third party data, you're getting much more detailed information about individuals. And then you bring in the wellness information, you know, from things like this watch yep. or the Apple watch, you know, everything you have, you're, you know, on one hand, you have a hospital that EKGs are protected. And yet on the other hand, you have smart watches that, that are considered a wellness product that carry EKG information all the time. So where's the differential? And I think this is an evolution that we're going to have over time that we probably have never seen before. Considering where we're at in terms of like, we're very comfortable as a society giving away data, browsing information, you know, your smartwatch data, pretty much everything. I, I, I can't chalk it up to any specific reason, but even you know, folks like you or I, I think that we're probably above average in terms of our willingness to give away data for convenience, just because it's, it's become so natural. Do you think that uh, do you think that society is putting itself in a risky position in terms of like maybe being subject to manipulation or all the negative harms that can come with, you know, privacy violations? Or do you think we still have a chance to kind of take some of that back? I don't think we have a chance to take back what's already been done. Uh, there may be a chance for future generations. I mean, if you think about things like global warming or you know, carbon capture or whatever, you know, what you're really trying to do is to protect future generations. If you go look at um, the research that talks about the, some of the most valuable forms of personal data, one of those that's the most valuable is a social security number of an infant. And the reason is, is because that's absolutely clean, right? And I think that at some point in time, we may be able to protect the future generations. I don't think we'll ever be able to protect the existing generations because of everything that's already out of the box. Do you, do you see any opportunity for solutions in terms of like getting maybe young people on board with a new way of thinking, education, regulations? Are you, do you have any ideas or do you see any trends that give you hope? I think the very fact that the new um, California regulation passed with something like 65% of the vote yeah. tells you either one, people were ill-informed because a lot of people did not expect that that would pass that way. 
the CPRA, or two, people are truly concerned and they just don't want companies running, you know, amok with their privacy, their personal data. I mean, if you look at the California definition, you know, it's something along the lines of anything identifiable, directly identifiable or indirectly identifiable about an individual or their family. Right. And that was a big paraphrase, but things like smart meters, things like toll tags, things like GPS is in your car. I mean, the data, there's stuff in there you never think about. And the only way you're ever going to get a handle on that is likely either through a higher level of culture, cha- cultural change within organizations. But then those companies that make the cultural change are afraid of losing out on the business. So it's going to be tough, which means you're going to have to rely on regulation, right? And yep. in the end, the regulation, I think, is what's going to force companies to continue to make changes where they haven't historically. Yeah. I think I saw it this weekend and I had a conversation with some of my cousin-in-laws and they know I do security and privacy work and they're very smart. Um, so they were asking me, you know, some questions about security and privacy. And one thing that, that came up was, you know, why should we be concerned about privacy? So I shared a couple of stories that some former clients were doing that wasn't anything malicious, but might just be surprising for them to know. So for example, I was telling them about how automated the process for uh, lending for mortgage lending has become, mm-hmm. where basically it can take a lot of data about you, your demographic, your spending history, and you come up with a lending decision pretty easily. And I was explaining to them like why that could impact privacy in the future, because that could, you know, the rights and freedoms of an individual could be impacted if you can't get a loan because of certain elements the company has on you. And that helped, I think that helped them understand one small way that privacy could be important. Or have you run into anything that you can talk about? I know you do consulting, so you might not be able to talk about it, but anything interesting that you see companies doing or that you've heard of companies doing that may, may not be, you know, common knowledge to, to people? In terms of changing for what I would perceive to be positive, or just like, uh, hey, you need to know that the companies are, are doing this these type of things, and here's some interesting anecdotes. Uh, you know, what's interesting um, to me is like all this cookie disclosure stuff. You know, yeah. now everybody has you know cookies yeah. and this. How many people have actually read what the cookie disclosure that they accept means? I mean, most people just click yes and move on. Right. And I, I think there's been studies out there. I think there's I don't know how to do the education component of how to protect people from themselves. And then there's the question of how much do people want to protect themselves? In the new world, my generation being much different than yours, yours being much different than others. In the new world, you know, social media is the new world and knowing everything about everybody just seems to be the new norm. And I, I'm relatively conservative and I'm a privacy professional and it just amazes me to see what people willingly and with knowledge put out there just to be cool. Yeah. So I don't know without government intervention and that's why I think the EU is taking such a strong approach. You know, some company got, got uh, some some company today has announced that the Netherlands got fined by the Dutch Data Protection Authority 500 and some odd thousand, you know, euro for not having a DPO appointed. I think, you know, it's going to take some big fines either in the U.S. or in Europe to really get some changes made at the foundational levels of companies where they begin to take a more active view of how to protect the citizenry as a whole versus the citizenry's selection process that's going to take probably one or two generations to educate yeah appropriately and that's one of the hardest things for me to articulate to someone so they can easily understand it is like why should they care about privacy in terms of like what's the Outside of maybe you'll get a fine or you'll be, you know, your insurance premiums go up or something, some theoretical like that, that's a monetary cost. I think everyone can kind of sense that there is a, a cost to losing your privacy or being continuously 
uh, surveilled, but it's hard to like put a pin in it. Like, why should I really care? What am I really giving up for that? Are, are you able to effectively coach, coach anyone on like why they should care about privacy? <laughs> I had, I had a conversation with a client not long ago and, and, um, uh, the client said, you know, we really don't have much of a problem. We do X, Y, or Z. And, and, you know, 20 minutes later, he says, okay, so now that you've scared the crap out of me, where do we go from here? Right. And, uh, you know, I had somebody, I did this session in a company and they said, I went home and took my kid's computer away. And I looked at all their cookie settings or I looked at their, you know, Facebook, uh, you know, privacy settings and things of that nature. And I think it's purely by education and one off. Yeah. And, and the sharing of that and the implications of that, that will make a difference ultimately. Yeah. Um, what worries me more is the disclosure of people who are 10 or 12 or 15 or 16. Yeah. Because in the modern generation, if you do not share, then you're not one of the cool people. And, you know, the, I mean, adults have enough trouble understanding the implications if you're a teenager and you're trying to fit in, understanding the implications are near impossible because of peer pressure. Yep. And I think that's what worries me more than an adult making a potential conscious decision or those who are making unconscious decisions that detrimentally affect them down the road for things like scholarships or, you know, credit reports, like you said, or yep. things of that nature. I almost think that there should be like in high school or maybe even earlier, like some kind of uh, maybe it's embedded in technology literacy courses, but some formal education on security and privacy, because I'm surprised at the number of people that like when you download a free app, you don't realize necessarily all of the things you're giving them access to, like your contact list, maybe your uh, maybe the recording device on your phone, et cetera. Or maybe you don't know how to enable multi-factor authentication on the security side. So it seems, and maybe this does exist, but just like financial literacy or, or uh, you know, basic uh, housekeeping and stuff like that was taught at a certain point in schools, maybe technology literacy and curriculum around security and privacy, we're at a place where I think that would make total sense. But I, are you seeing any of that? Do you know of any curriculum that exists? I, I don't, and I'm not even, you know, when I, when I went through high school, business finance was a required course, you know, and a lot of people took accounting and things of that yeah. nature. Now you don't see those types of courses anymore. And I'd love to see something like what you're saying, and maybe there are certain schools that do, but I think the competition for the school day is, is particularly hard as it is and adding a technology literacy or a technology implication without being in the, you know, there used to be back in my olden days, the audio visual club, you know, yeah. we were guys who put up all the movie 16 millimeter movies in each of the classrooms. Right. And I think that where you will see that is an after school type programs, much yeah. more or boy scouts or girl scouts, much more than you will, it being taught as a routine nature and, and a lot of kids will just blow it off again because of yeah. the competition aspects. Right, there's, I also like uh, speculate that there's a conflict of interest when like Google and Microsoft are giving away free Chromebooks and tablets to all the schools. It's very hard to encourage them to also, you should do some security and privacy curriculum on this when we're giving you all this technology. Like, I don't know if those two well, things are congruent. Or, you know, it was a couple of years ago, school system, there, one or two school systems got caught at remotely activating cameras in people's homes, you know, because they've given away the things. Uh, those are the yeah. things that just scare me, right? And then you can't stop bad actors. You will never, ever stop bad actors. So even... You know, the, the trusted parties, right? Trusted trusted parties in the technology realm, they have the keys to the kingdom and you're never going to totally stop that. And, you know, whether, I mean, modern events, right? You have, you have the stupidity of some of what people do with firearms. You're going to have the stupidity of what some people do with personal data. And that's yeah. not the way they're the same. But, you know, you can't fix stupid. 
and yeah. you know, all you can do is try and protect yourself as much as you can through whatever means you can. And that swings back around, I think, to the educational aspects that you were talking about. I don't know how you will ever do that without government mandating it as part. And I don't think it's a priority for government or the U.S. would already have a federal privacy law. Yep. What about emerging tech? Is there anything that excites you in, in terms of uh, new technology or new tools available from a security or privacy or just an IT perspective in general? No, I think it's more the common sense approach of using what's there, right? Yeah. This is this this is one of those areas that if you maximize the use of what was there, the, the protections would be adequate. I mean, there's studies that talk about, you know, a four letter password versus a four letter number password versus an eight number eight letter versus yep. an eight number and how many iterations that would take. Um, I think, you know, maximizing the implementation of what's capable and minimizing the data collection and ensuring you have the lawful basis of processing or the, le the legitimate business need. I think companies have to take a leadership role. And, you know, you're seeing some of this in the Apple commercial. They're going, you know, look at us, look yep. at us. Um, I think that differentiation is beginning to occur where we're trying to stand up to a higher standard than others. That's not meaning that Apple's the only one. There are companies out there, again, as I said, you know, 30 or 40 minutes ago, that are really trying to differentiate themselves to do the right thing for the right reason. I think bio, uh, biotech, biopharma, med device, healthcare, healthcare provider, they've always, banking, they've always been highly regulated and felt they had a higher calling. And I think other industries are now beginning to catch up to doing the right thing for the right reason and to have a higher ethical calling than what we've historically seen when the world was wide open and everybody was trying to rush the market to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Robert, I appreciate your time uh, today and, and thank you for everything you're doing in terms of educating the world on privacy and doing great work in the consulting field. So if people want to get in touch with you and, and learn more about you, what's the best way to reach you? So it'd be uh, just robert.glaser, G-L-A-S-E-R, at conduit, C-O-N-D-U-I-T, privacy.com, or robert.glaser at Entesis. 360.com awesome you know, either, either way or call you you know you in, touch. Get in touch with me excellent well if you guys enjoyed content like this uh you can check risk 360's podcast out tuesday morning grind on youtube so you can go to youtube and search risk 360 check out tuesday morning grind we're also available on all the major podcast apps if you rather listen than see our beautiful faces here on youtube uh <laughs> We're on uh, iTunes, we're on Google, we're on all of that, so you can uh, search for us there. So thanks again, Robert. It's a great conversation. Well, I enjoyed it. It's always fun to geek out a little bit. Absolutely. Talk all right, you. you take care. Be safe.